Our next speaker is Kuran, Kuran Nirsar, and he's a machine learning engineer at Weights and Biases. Those of you who have ever wondered, like, what is ML Ops? There's all this talk about ML Ops. You're about to find out more. Welcome, Kuran. Hello. Hello. Can you, everyone hear me OK? Perfect. Hey, hello, everyone. And thanks a lot for joining me for today's session. So uh, yeah, I'm Karan Nisar. I'm a machine learning engineer with Weights and Biases. And today, I'll be talking about the best practices for effective machine learning teams. And I'll just walk through like what Weights and Biases is, what the machine learning landscape is. And what I'll do is I'll start uh, like with this quote. So it says, like, getting a model into production is a solved problem, but coordinating efforts on machine learning is not. I know it can be like, difficult to like, understand this, probably. There's a lot of times we have seen, like, with machine learning, like, coordinating efforts has been, like, a bigger challenge. And that is something that we have seen with a lot of our customers and users. And that is what I'll be covering like, in today's session. So when, uh, and I'll be talking about like these three things, just talking about like the background of weights and biases, talking about some challenges like that we have seen with a lot of our users, and the solutions to some of those challenges. So now, uh, to weights and biases. Oops. Yeah. So weights and biases is a machine learning developer friendly platform. So it was designed like primarily focused on those experts. And what we do is we work on a day-to-day -day basis with those machine learning practitioners and try to see like, what is it that, like, what are the main pain points of those machine learning practitioners. Like one of the examples you can see in this particular image, like this image from, uh, is of an open AI office. So here you can see like, on one of their office walls, they actually have the weights and biases product like, put up on like, their office walls that is used by everyone within the OpenAI team for consumption. And similarly, we have a bunch of other customers and users that love to use our platform. And it's because of these users, we get to understand like, what are their main pain points, what is it that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's how we are constantly working on revamping our platform like, every day. So now, let's just look at the machine learning landscape. So this is an image from a few years ago. And here you can see, like, nowadays, every other industry is starting to build machine learning models or machine learning teams. And again, this is an image of a like, few years ago. Like, looking at a more recent image, you can see like, this, pretty, this, this diagram is so large. Like, it's so tough. I can't even read like, entirely all of those names. But this gives a sense of how fast this landscape or this machine learning realm is expanding. You can see every other industry is trying to get into this machine learning space. And this is the primary reason why you need like, best practices and best standards so that you can effectively scale, and not just scale, but as well as collaborate efficiently like, within your company or like, within a research team as well. So how does machine learning development differ from those traditional software engineering development? So if you look at this image, you can see, like, for software development, like, at every stage, we have well-defined tools, and we have well-defined standards that everyone as an industry agrees upon. But that's not the case for machine learning. Like, for machine learning, we don't have any standardized tools or even any standards that are commonly agreed upon by the entire industry, or like, at least with most of those researchers. So looking at the machine learning workflow, it's primarily, I would say, classified into three main domains. The first is the data curation, which basically talks about like, all of those data preparation, so collecting those labels, like, exploring and cleaning that data, preparing and transformation. So when you talk about some of the specifics, these includes like the final output would be things like your pre-processing data set or your evaluation or training data set. The next is the modeling phase. And modeling phase mainly talks about the training and experimentation like, and the evaluation phase. It has its own set of artifacts and other components. And all of these components can be very useful to track. So things like your terminal logs, your system metrics, like anything like, like your evaluation results. 
these becomes very important like, in order to track all of those things, like once you're performing or iterating on different machine learning models. I think the last step is the deployment step, where it talks about the packaging and deployment, as well as the serving and monitoring phase. So this stage has its own set of artifacts, uh, which is mainly around like model prediction or even things like alerts. And if you look at it, this entire process is cyclic. So you start from the development, you build your model, you deploy it. Once your model is deployed, you try to see if there is any regressions or any errors within your existing deployed model, or even you just try to make sure your models are updated over a period of time. And that is when you go back to that cyclic loop, again, like trying to think if you need more data sets or if you need like a better model architecture or anything that you would want to make sure your models are updated and they give you the best possible results that you want. But with that, it comes up with a lot of challenges. As you can see in the previous slide, there are so many like, different variable factors that impact the performance of your machine learning model. So some of the major challenges, I think one and the most important one is like anything that's not tracked. So all of those untracked processes are brittle. And this reminds me of this particular question on Stack Overflow, which was asked like, almost a decade ago. Like someone asked, why should I use version control? And if you look at uh, like the highlighted text here, it actually says the like, code does not exist unless it's checked into a version control system. And if you think about it, it's pretty hilarious, but at the same time, it's like very true. And it's the same case for machine learning. Like if you don't have your machine learning models that are version controlled, it basically does not exist. And the reason being, at any point in time when you're constantly iterating, if you have no version control, like no sense to version or automatically capture in your models, you're just running around in circles, just trying to identify, like, was it version 10, was it version 100? How do I reproduce some of those things? So it becomes very difficult. So that's the main reason like, why untracked processes are brittle. At the same time, like, if you do not have automatic uh, like versioning on your data set, it basically means that your IP is vulnerable. Like, a lot of times you have seen like, most of those like, individual team members are working in silos, so everyone has their own set of models. A lot of times, if a team member leaves that organization, like, all of that work is just left with that particular person, and it, becomes, it, it really involves a lot of time and effort just trying to reproduce something that's already been done before. So looking at this machine learning workflow, you can see the process that's highlighted here. These are some of the key elements that we would want to track and have a good sense of what's happening. So what I'll do is, I'll, uh, we have seen this with multiple customers. I'll just talk about one case study of one of our users or one of our customers, OpenAI. So this is uh, regarding this OpenAI's Dactyl project. So what OpenAI has done is, for this particular project, they were trying to train a robotic arm to solve a Rubik's Cube. And this is, again, a single-handed puzzle. So like, even for a human, it's quite difficult. Like, this entire process is difficult, so they were trying to train it for a robotic arm. So what they did it was they started a very simpler problem. So what they did is, instead of a Rubik's Cube, they tried to make sure that the hand is able to develop or just like, rotate like a normal, regular cube. And that way, they would generate more data to see like, how the data is performing, how the robotic arm is performing. But it, even with this simpler problem, there were many challenges. It turned out that this particular hand required a lot of coordination. Like, oftentimes, as you can see in this image here, like, the arm would just drop that cube. So what would happen is it would become like this in itself is another major challenge. So what OpenAI did is they separated their team and they tried to attack it from multiple angles. So every other machine learning developer was working on their own laptops, on their own personal machines, trying to figure out a way to solve this problem, like to generate better models. So what happened is they ended up getting the most, like the best accurate result. And when it came to like sharing those results, they had a hard time. The major Everyone had their own individual systems in place in their own laptops. There was no central place. So what happened is someone used a log file to share a result. Like someone used things like a tensor board to share those results. And there was this one specific instance where some user had launched a tensor board kernel on a virtual machine, and he shared those results of an accuracy on their team Slack channel. 
what happened is two days later, someone else asked him to share the results of a validation accuracy. But within those two days, like the TensorBoard kernel was long gone. So the only best way to get an answer to that question was to actually rerun that entire code, retrain that entire model, which resulted in wasting those expensive compute hours, as well as it ended up spending a lot of time. And the main reason that happened is because they had no visibility. So all of those contexts that you see in that modeling phase, all of that was lost, just because everyone was working in silos and there was no central place. So this is not just for OpenAI, but for a lot of our customers, like these are the main, I would say, like three categories where I can summarize the major challenges. The first is knowledge management. It becomes very difficult to track and compare models when everyone's working in silos like across different teams. It also becomes very like, inefficient to reproduce those models. Like, it goes back to the version control thing that I was talking about. If you do not have things that are version controlled, like, reproducibility can, a very, can be a very big pain. And at the same time, it delays all of those reportings. The next is standardization. Like everyone follows like ad hoc workflows across the team, it becomes very difficult to standardize. At the same time, it limits the visibility into your process. So anytime you want to share your results, your outcomes with your key stakeholders or like project managers, it's literally you're just scattering around asking different people for different files just because you, know, you do not have a standardized way. So what some organizations do is they'll create in their own internal tools, which can be like a high maintenance cost, at the same time, there can be some like, external vendors that people use which might lock in. So that way, it becomes very difficult to deploy like, some of those tools. And this, is, like, and this is what an ideal solution should look like. So to target all of these three major challenges, I think the first thing you would want is like, better reproducibility. So having better data lineage on top of yeah, all the things that you're doing, having better version control so you can easily reproduce like at any point in time, any data set, any model, any piece of element that you would require to run machine learning on. So that way you need like a reliable and automatic system of records. The next would be visualization. So along with having all of those system of records, you also need a better way to create live dashboards. You also need like a better way where you can collaborate and at the same time like all of your efforts are like moving in together rather than like, each and everyone working in silos. So that gives better visibility for the stakeholders into the machine learning projects. And third is having faster integration. As we know, machine learning is quite varied. There are tons and tons of libraries out there. So having a single platform that can easily plug into any popular framework or any framework as well. So that way you do not have any vendor lock-in. At the same time, it's very easy to deploy and maintain all of those uh, like systems that you're currently working. So giving you that rich user experience. And that is something that Weights and Biases is focused on. And that was the main reason like, why our, co our founders started this company. So Weights and Biases is trying to be that system of records for machine learning. Just like you have Salesforce for sales, you have Jira for engineering. Weights and biases would be that reliable, like, central system of records for anything machine learning. And these are, I would say, the primary or the core features that weights and biases offers. It is, gives you the ability to store, like, measure, or track all of your experiments in just one centralized place. At the same time, it helps you track all of your GPU and CPU hours, so that way you know like, if you're overutilizing your system or like, help you save that extra I mean, cost, that a compute cost that you might end up spend, uh, spending which you do not need. At the same time, it gives you like model checkpoints. So it's very easy to quickly find and like reproduce previous versions of your models, your data sets, your code, like pretty much anything that you want. At the same time, weights and biases will help you like, analyze and version all of your data. So you can store every stage of your pipeline and it's not just, like machine learning can be quite varied. You can work on some traditional machine learning things on a tabular data set. You might work on some deep learning, uh, like work for some rich media types. Like with weights and biases, you can store all of that in just one central place. So we do have supports for like not just images, but as well as for audios, like videos, 3D point clouds, like even molecular images as well. So anything that you want, you can have like automatic version control on top of that. And it gives you like one central place where you can collaborate on best practices and insights. 
So you can easily share your results, like in a LaTeX format, in a PDF format. So that way, it's easily accessible by anyone like within your organization or anyone that you would want to share your results with. So finally, like weights and biases would be that system of records. So that way, you can easily like manage your IP, scale from a single user to like a team of like hundreds or thousands of users. So it can be that one place where you log all of that stuff. And going back to that OpenAI example, so let's say if someone would ask you a week later to share in some of those results, like all of those results are logged into the Weights and Biases platform. So like no need to rerun those results or make any changes. So in conclusion, like the machine learning workflow is messy. But Weights and Biases has those tools like to standardize like that entire process. So it gives you that ability to like version in your data sets, gives you an ability to track in those experiments automatically, but at the same time, like log in your models, like with those model registry, and then track those models once that is deployed into production. And we have like a lot of our a huge customer base. So you can see our NPS is like quite high. It's almost at 76, which is way par the industry standards. And you can see some of those customer or user testimonials. Like one thing I would like to highlight is uh, like on the left, this one guy rated as 11 on a scale of 1 to 10. So that in itself, you can see uh, how we can use weights and biases. Uh, at the same time, like weights and biases is free for academic and researchers. So like if any one of you would want to give it a try, like just go to our website and set up an account. It's just like it literally takes less than two minutes to get started with using weights and biases. So in conclusion, like effective machine learning teams have automated tooling to capture progress. So, like, and if anyone is interested, like, if has any questions, or would want to get into a specific, uh, I would say, feature, if we have a booth right outside, so I would be more than happy to walk you through the product, answer any questions that you have. I think this is one link that you can go if you're interested, just to get started. And if you have any questions, like, I'm more than happy to answer them. Like, thank you.